think we're ready. I think we're ready to jump in. Yeah. All right. So, hi. Hey. Hey, Sam. <laughs> hey. Back at it. This time we're talking about you. I had the um, the lucky pleasure because I don't have either of your books here with me in Germany at the moment, and um, I had the l- lucky uh, pleasure of being over at Georg, my brother-in-law's apartment in Munich, and he had invitations encounters out on his coffee table, and so I got to have a little intimate time. Uh, that sounds weird. <laughs> I got to. <laughs> Got to have some uh, some time flipping through it. Uh, Looking at a photo book is should be intimate. That's, it, it was that's intimate. part of the point of putting those pictures. Yes, in something you can hold in your hand. Yeah, it was intimate. What maybe wasn't the wrong word. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure having not looked through it for a while, um, and just being astounded again by how good every single picture in that book is. I, w- I was trying to remember, I didn't have time to read the introduction. Was that all one trip or was it across more than one trip? It was, t- it was two different trips. Um, okay. The, the two times that I've been to India, yeah. both, both of course were, were trips with Avni, my partner, who's got a lot of family in India. Her parents are bo- both immigrated from Bombay and have a lot of their family still there. And she has traveled there throughout her life. I think the two trips that we took together were like her 13th and 14th trip to India or mm. something like that. Um, mm. And in both cases, we, we spent time in Bombay with her family visiting lots of different aunts and uncles and cousins and second cousins, and then traveling in other parts of the country, you know, as, as visitors, as, as tourists and, mm-hmm the photographs that I shot during those two trips are what became invitations encounters. Okay. Yeah. i it felt like it had to be too, because it just, the, the breadth of it and, you know, the, the, for you to have gotten that many amazing images to have done it only in one trip seems almost impossible. And, and I feel like there's evidence of there being at least some sort of previous experience traveling through India. I know some of them would have been on the first one and then others would have been on the second, but it just, it, it's the thing that's most amazing about it to me is because it feels like a knowing eye that is familiar while at the same time feeling like a traveler who's marveling over something that is different than one's own usual milieu and one's own usual cultural, you know, colorfulness and everything and environment. So it has that dual quality to it, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, of course was an outsider in a lot of ways being there. And I think being so fortunate to have the, the family connection and, and be, be invited to connect with the place and people who had affection for me already, whether or not we'd met before or here in the States or never met at all, but had, but knew of me through Avni, sort of offered me a, such an in. And then it, it was really such a remarkable experience how often I would be somewhere and feel that, that, that people who were seeing me were interested in me as mm. visibly somebody who was not from there and would be excited to come over, to talk to me, to connect, to, mm-hmm. when they saw my camera, ask if I would take their picture. And that's, that's a big part of what the title references that yes. the, the invitations from family, but then the invitations also from strangers to, to engage with them. It was a surprisingly not pushy experience to try to connect with um, the people that I met almost always. Um, yeah, and I think that's there's a must have been a reciprocity to that. You know, it begins with you being open. You know, in a way that you know when I look at it, it, it feels like a very brave book. And here in Red Hook, always felt brave to me as well. Like. I, I picture you on the street stopping someone who's never seen you and who you maybe have seen around or, you know, I know in some cases it is people that you knew in some capacity, 
Um, but in other cases, it was your first encounter with somebody. And it always struck me as brave because I'm not somebody who will readily stop somebody that I don't know on the street to do anything, let alone to, to ask them to do something as intimate, there's that word again, um, as to say, I'm, can I take your picture and take it with me forever, <laughs> you know? Um, so it strikes me as brave, but it's, it's really interesting to hear that a lot of it was people coming to you. And that must also speak to the culture of India. I think it does. Yeah. Um, and um, I hope it also speaks to something about how, you know, I carry myself yeah, you being in, open those, in, space. in those spaces yeah. and being open. Yeah. And, um, I certainly, the reason that I have engaged in that type of photography is that I'm so interested in people. I'm so interested in using the camera to make a connection with somebody that I wouldn't possibly have any other way to or any other opportunity to make a connection with and mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you saying that it's brave because it does take some nerve or some like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna whatever part of me is feeling shy right now is less important than the chance of having something interesting happen with this person and the chance of making a photograph that I'm excited to to create mm -hmm. and the but it does um I think in both places in, in Brooklyn and Red Hook and in India, the confidence builds with every, with every good interaction, like with every time that I do that right. and I walk away and feel that that person's day has been made more interesting by meeting me or they were complimented mm -hmm. or tickled or uh, taken out of their daily whatever to, to have an unusual interaction and, and, and that they understood that I was interested in, in something about them. Um, and yes. that feels great. It feels really exciting. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's also a little bit sad that, that that's possibly the end. You know, there's sometimes I manage to get people's contact information and send them the photographs, mm -hmm. either, either printed out or um, texted or emailed. And, and sometimes it is just that, that only one interaction um, yeah. and then I get to I get to live with the photographs and especially if they if they're ones that that really work and I feel like the the connection the dignity the uniqueness of the person really comes through like my relationship with that photograph deepens and sometimes it's it is kind of sad like I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to the person just from getting to go back and look at them and edit the mm. picture and choose to put it in a certain spot in a book next to another image. Um, yeah. But often that doesn't, I mean, in some cases with the Red Hook book, especially I was able to share the book with many, but not all of the people who are in it. Um, and then that gave me a second chance to get to sort of celebrate that that chance interaction had, had turned into a photograph that, had a lasting effect. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that there there was that that other layer of the relationship that continued. But it, just to go back to what you were saying about how you have an ongoing relationship with it, you know, regardless of whether you get to cycle it back to share it with the subject. That's interesting to think about, like, because I in preparing for this, I was thinking about you know what is it that a photograph does that no no other art form does and you know i think one of the things that was that was floating around that i just didn't quite get to articulate and maybe i won't in talking about it out loud either but it's it's a frozen moment and thus it is it all that it leaves out is enormous um, and but somehow the absence that surrounds it of knowing what happened exactly before and what happened after or even who this person is creates so much magnetism on the one moment that has been frozen. Um, and it's like it sort of it's it loads it with power and then and creates this attention vacuum, I think. You know, that's a lot of my experience with photographs that I love is like I yeah, you know, I, I want to look at all the details to almost find a story because so much of it is 
unsaid and unfixed, right? And, and I think that's one of the things about photography that's so interesting. It's also a kind of duality that it's one of the more fixed art forms, certainly far more than video or music. And yet it has arguably the strongest capacity for ongoing unfixed interpretation and experience. Yeah, I think that um, there are always things that I find in pictures over time. And I think that some of my most successful pictures are ones where layers, layers of meaning in a face, but also in all the other details, layers that suggest things about history, that suggest things about culture in a very broad sense that suggest things about sort of natural history uh, and how time has, has affected everything in that picture from if there are plants, if there are roads, if there are buildings, if there is clothing that in that instant, how many, how many, how many layers of history and time can be suggested that we'll never know the full story to, but Mm. could could sort of could play in our minds um, as we get to look and let the different pieces of a picture kind of spark our interest in how the world got to look that way right how the street yeah. got to look that way you know yeah and all the overlapping layers of time you know it's the 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 span of the life of this you know the human subjects that you're looking at or animal subjects or yeah again the the history of the road or the shop or the you know how long that shelf that sign has been on that shelf yeah. or how many years has this teapot been how many times has this teapot made a batch of tea and and yeah and and to be able to capture all that history um, accordion into one frozen moment is really a it's a wild when you think about it in those terms it's a a wild thing to be able to behold the photographs that you make have always seemed very much about the present you know despite uh, de, what well, not despite but very much about the present while also being about the story of history and context that um, is behind that present moment and the presence of whatever souls are present in the moment. Yeah, I think, I mean, of course, photography necessarily exists in the present and, or, you know, that's, yep. but um, I think that I'm most attentive to living in the present probably when I, have the camera in my hand and I'm in a situation where I'm excited about what's around me to take pictures of. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that chance to try to block out everything else and be so awake to what's in front of me, whether it's a chance to face to face interact with somebody and look at them while they're looking at me mm -hmm. and help them feel at, at ease or like there's, there's some dignity and reciprocity in what's happening between us. And often it's, um, you know, it's, it's more intimate than we usually, than the ways that we usually interact with strangers. Uh, but to be, to be okay in that present uh, kind of intensity. Um, and sometimes it's just about color and, and, and the light changing. And yeah. the there's a whole history of photographers believing that there's a decisive moment or one particular s millisecond when the shutter should be pressed and that that's what's going to make the great picture. And that's mm -hmm. not, that's not my primary focus. I'm not um, always just waiting for everything to come together. Often the moments that I capture are slower, but, but not always. And sometimes, um, you know, I can think about pictures where it was about, you know, more than one person sort of falling into place within a frame mm -hmm. and then being ready and fortunate and skill, you know, the sort of combining luck and skill to, to shoot the picture at that, at that moment of the present so that it will 
everything that I want can fit within a, mm-hmm. within a composition. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's easy to think that making photographs is easier than it really is. And, you know, arguably it's the most accessible art form currently. Everybody has a high quality phone in their pocket, more or less. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of people would say, if asked, like, do you think you're good at taking pictures? And probably a huge percentage of people would be like, yeah, I think I'm good at taking pictures, you know, and, and, you know, only if, you know, a much smaller percentage would say, I take pictures with an artistic aesthetic in mind. The majority, vast majority of photos are being taken more as a type of recording, you know, or, you know, in, in, in maybe in in sort of the lesser forms, I don't mean to be judgmental, but it is a sort of a way of recording something that you can then show off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's that you know, being having dabbled in amateur art making photography myself, and we should get into our sort of shared origin story because I think that'll be interesting to go back to. Um, in a moment, but that, that, that feeling that it, it is sort of a question of being really attentive enough to the moment and to where you're, where, how you're framing and what's happening within the frame and then deciding when to press the button. And, and it, that's also different when you're dealing with film or something like Hasselblad, like you take pictures on Hasselblad and sometimes, and that it's your, each frame is, is precious. It's not cheap. You have to develop it and that you can't just do a burst, you know, and that's a really different kind of photography than, you know, you picture the classic like fashion or, or advertising photographer that just has endless amount of pictures that they can take. And then they go through a sheet you know, or not a sheet anymore. They just can go through hundreds and hundreds of pictures and find the ones that came out well versus when you sort of just have one, maybe two, maybe three at best with a film camera or with a moment that's passing um, to, to get a shot that really speaks of something. Yeah. Should we, um, should we talk about our, our, our past and how we come to <laughs> yeah so <laughs> we for the yeah so for the listener um well f- first and foremost we're we're best friends from when we were eight years old is that right i think that's right i think that's right um second grade and uh fast forward uh, to high school we were after um spending all kinds of time together doing all kinds of other things we ended up in the same photography class uh, with miss kravitz uh, which was a classic darkroom photography class and i also had in my basement um a dark room just a, uh, an at-home dark room that my parents had set up um, with an enlarger and and all the chemicals and the red light and everything and i'm not sure on the timeline like how much um how much i, I think my first interaction with a with a photography dark room was in your basement i think before before okay. i ever was in the one yep. at the at our high school um yeah uh, my my first chance to make a test strip and try to determine mm-hmm. how much time the light should come down and and shine on that light sensitive paper projecting a negative down was um, was in your was in your basement. I teach that uh, that process almost every day now uh, at the school where I teach. So it's it's funny to try to remember back to when that was a complete mystery to me, and I was first discovering what it was like to put a piece of photographic paper into the developer. And after about 30 seconds, the image starts to emerge. Um, magic. <laughs> it's magic. It's magic. It's so exciting. Yeah. And um, I don't, you know, I don't think uh, it was a long time after that, that I think I really started to understand the artistic power of photography, but mm-hmm. my, 
but my curiosity about the the sort of where where science and and magic c- come together and the ability mm-hmm. to, to fix an image on on film or on paper um, definitely started then. That's cool. Yeah, I, I, I sort of guessed that that was the timeline that I, I couldn't remember for sure, but it felt to me true that we had our dark room before we ended up in class together. Um, but that's cool to know that that's that's your first memory or your first experience of those. Um, you know, those. It, it, I think anybody who's ever had that experience immediately recognizes recognizes it as a magical one even though it is completely scientific um but your students do you feel like it strikes them as something out of time or do you think they're able to integrate it just like they do anything else being like this is a thing that exists in my time or do they did, was there ever any sort of commentary or marveling over it as like, wow, this is some crazy old, old school stuff? Well, they certainly have had so much more experience with taking pictures, even as, you know, I get to teach some of them in fourth and fifth grade and, you know, I'd probably held the family camera a handful of times when I was that age, but they've got so much more sense of like camera. It's on the phone. You press a button, take a picture. And yet the chance to make photographs using film or photographic paper and the dark room. I think it's interesting. It's fascinates them in a way that's, it is present. It's not just, well, I get to do something old fashioned. It's I get to do something in a way that's so much more hands-on and um, instead of the mystery being hidden under layers of, you know, software development by a billion dollar corporations, but just being like right, (laughs) right there on Mm -hmm. chemicals interacting with a piece of paper because light changes silver crystals. Um, it's not just cool because it's old. It's amazing yeah. because it's, they get to do it and hold it in their hands. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't mean to suggest that it's only, the only thing that's interesting about it is that it's old. <laughs> but they do. I mean, I think they do have a sense of it being, um, of it being old. Um, well, and, and yeah, as you just articulated so well, of it being so, so vastly different from the normal experience of taking pictures and uh, on your phone and and being able to print them out at CVS or whatever if, if if you even want to do that or just send them straight to social media or never look at them again <laughs> um, what do you do you could you articulate what the sort of foremost things that you're trying to teach your students beyond the technical process like what do you what do you say to them to try and get them to make interesting pictures or pictures that are or or to have an experience that that is meaningful for them that's a good question um i think a lot of it is about trying to wake them up to the world around them and and to, to really see they, you know, the school that I teach at is, there's a lot expected of them. The, especially the ones who are in, in high school are, they, you know, all their classes are demanding. They're involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. Often they're at school until late, their lives are busy. And that's, that's not the ideal um, sort of way of living, in my opinion, to make, to be a photographer, because being a photographer, you have to slow down and be in the moment um, and not be trying to do much else other than see mm-hmm. and use your camera. 
So encouraging them to make the time where that's what they get to focus on is really important. Um, and, you know, I think you can take a good photograph of almost anything. Mm -hmm. And so helping them think about, okay, you have this tool in your hand. What is it that you want to record on this, you know, 35 millimeters of light sensitive film is, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's almost a lot of responsibility when you could, when you could take a picture of anything, what are you going to take a picture of? I certainly feel it as an artist. And mm -hmm. um, I think the, the most interesting experience as a photography student for them is when they start to have a strong opinion about what they want to take photographs of and then seek yeah. that out. Um, yeah. And sometimes it's their friends and sometimes it's their family and sometimes it's the buildings in the neighborhood and how the light hits the architectural details at different times. And, um, mm -hmm. but, but I want them to decide, you know, I want them to grapple with that question of what is it that you would like to photograph? And they come to all kinds of different conclusions about that. And I think that's great. And I think once, once they're, awaken to those questions, they can answer them in all different kinds of ways. And it's okay if it takes a lot of, you know, twists and turns. Um, so I think that's, that's mm -hmm. a big part of it. That's really nice. That's, um, it, I, while you're talking, I was reminded um, that your master's thesis was on play and art art education specifically or art making in general art well art 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 making as play and then if yeah. if if art making can be play how do we bring that into art education yeah um and, and now play i'm wishing, very much about I'm wishing i had read that but i haven't <laughs> you should send me that um but even just that in conjunction with what you were just saying um, it's another duality actually the the sense of responsibility you know that you're trying to confer upon them to, so that they 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 take they take it upon themselves as a responsibility to do something interesting with this this highly sensitive um you know sort of precious in a way film film really makes it different than a di than a digital camera and and it's it's sort of finite and um but at the same time it has to be fully open and free within that context of, mm, I want to use this film. I want to use my time. I want to use my attention responsibly, but at the same time, you need to be playing with the world around you and playing with your own relationship to it in order to, to f actually find something that is alive rather than forced. You know, I, I, I just, when you were talking about the way light hits buildings, I think back to this senior photography project I did with Mr. Warthen on architectural, I did an architectural photography, like extra credit thing, or like an independent study. And I made this collection of photographs um, of architectural moments in our shared hometown, Amherst, Massachusetts. And, and I think they weren't very alive. I think they were quite technical and they were just searching for cool moments of architecture in a town with relatively limited cool architectural moments. And, and I think probably I was taking it all a little too seriously. I'm, I'm sure this is about me. Yeah, that's there's... just a way of that's just a way of reflecting, you know, what you're saying about how to sort of engage your students both with a sense of responsibility and a playful sense of, you know, you could take pictures of absolutely anything that's, you know, that you find interesting. You know, but but don't don't take it so lightly that it just doesn't matter. You know, I go I sometimes go a while between taking photographs that I feel very serious about mm -hmm. um, or very um, excited about because, because yeah. it, it is, it is, it is both serious and, and playful and fun at the same time. You know, I've been places in the world where I've enjoyed taking a few pictures 
and others like most of my time in India where I felt I absolutely needed to take pictures because I was so interested in where I was and mm -hmm. um, being keenly excited by taking pictures of something is sometimes it's a choice and sometimes it's just the world saying yeah look at me and and then i might getting to respond to that yeah absolutely i certainly experienced that sometimes with taking pictures and definitely with writing you know where i could be on one vacation one place and not be inspired by the place or the experience to do much writing at all and then others just sort of just they they make it happen <laughs> it's just by by their nature um, this is, I think that's a good moment to, um, to pivot into talking about the more recent pictures that you're making, which are not yet gathered into um, a collection other than some that you sent me and some that are already up on your website, andyvernonjones.com. Uh, and uh, in connection to this idea of play and intentionality, uh, I wrote to you a bit about this, but they, there is there is definitely a new element in some of these newer images where you you seem to have been doing some staging of your subjects where you have an idea in your mind beforehand of a shape that you want them to make or gestures or interactional gestures um, in a specific place where you have, it seems, it just has that feeling that you envision like, okay, we're gonna be over here by these rocks in this river and you're gonna stand there and you're gonna stand here and you're gonna be reaching out towards each other. And and it's it seems to be a composed photographic uh, moment of expression and or even, I, I, I guess the first question I can ask is, are you, um, are you trying to say something in particular with any of these? Yes, I think I am. Um, you know, talking about or writing about photographs, I always find the, um, I'm sometimes at a loss for words. And I think that can be good because I'm, I'm often trying to say something that I think I can best say through photographs. Uh, you know, through an image um, and the words can kind of dance around it. But, but the things that I'm thinking about that I wanna to bring to those, to those shoots, to, to bring to the viewer's mind when they get to experience those photos are, they're more intentional than the kind of just recognition of the interesting landscape of human life and trying to connect with an individual and in mm -hmm. their history and their dignity. I mean, I'm, that's, that's specific in some ways, but it's very much responding to what's around me. Whereas these are ideas that are in my head and I'm choosing to try to create a situation where I can make a photograph that says something. Um, and what I'm trying to talk about is about our experience as human beings on this planet and remembering something that I think is innate in all of us, that we are very connected to the planet that we're living on. Um, it's, and that we are, have the potential to be connected to each other, sort of in that experience of living on this planet. And a lot of them, you know, I'm thinking about the crisis that we're in as a, as a species on this planet, um, an environmental and climate crisis. And not making pictures that are so explicitly about some aspect of that crisis, but more, what, what do I imagine? How could I picture the kind of feeling of reaching for something different, for something past destroying our environment, um, mm -hmm. for something past chasing profits um, and leaving individual human beings and the lands that we inhabit behind. And sometimes that's, there are images that come to, come to me as I'm daydreaming. Um, I'll see something and think, oh, could I reinterpret that? Because that almost, that, that strikes a chord in me. Um, and how could, I, how could I get people together to, 
to stage a moment that would talk about um, something about <sighs> kind of what's the way forward. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the way forward for our, for our species includes a lot of things, including, you know, legislation and uh, inventing new ways to capture carbon. And those, that's not what these pictures are about. They're about a way forward of, of our hearts. Um, right. And some of these things sound kind of cheesy when you put them in words. No, they and, don't. And I'm, my hope is, my hope is to, to, well, that, thank you. That's good. Uh, but I think that, um, I can say the most poetically and hopefully in a way that will wiggle into different people's minds through my medium of photography. Right. Yeah. Um, and well, just, just this once I had to ask you to put it into words. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and it you, probably, you, you know, done very well. Yeah. Some of, some of, some of the pictures, the, the, the kind of processes is, is more specific. And one of the, my images that, that I, I put the most into staging and creating and i i feel translates the my idea the best is a picture with uh five people actually there are six people in the picture um, but five of them have their arms linked across a river mm -hmm. sitting on chairs and and that are that are placed in the river and they are ankle deep in the water bridging the space and um I'm looking at it right now. In some ways, it's a, it's a, <laughs> there's so much artifice. It's clearly not a situation that would ever come up in mm -hmm. real life or that you would ever have a need to do other than the need to feel connected across that space to um, create a, a sort of a line of defense against whatever um, the, the, the threats that are, that are impending whether they be concrete or, or more uh, ephemeral threats like greed or disconnection, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, suggesting the certainly water comes into a lot of those pictures. And yeah, um, water is something that I felt very connected to from very young and just like so many early memories, some of them, in, you know, including you of, of um, seeking out the water that was flowing or, or there to be swam in or, or there to be waded in, uh, in whatever environments that we were growing up, including the, the neighborhood and the woods around it where we lived. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, but water is, water is key to this crisis, right? That we need to protect yeah. the water, that the water is, uh, quite dangerous when not taken care of. And when the climate isn't taken care of, the water is gonna, um, already is killing people and, and, and affecting people's livelihoods and, and homes. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the water is rising up around these chairs, um, but that in this case, the people are, are sitting firm and, and clinging to each other uh, mm -hmm. is, you know. There's a, there's a so calmness there. to it. Um, and it, you, you have the feeling it, it's, it doesn't feel like the water is rising up in a way that is going to be insurmountable. Right. And it's, it has everything to do with the fact that they're all linked together, all these, these souls holding hands and you feel a kind of strength uh, and a, and a peacefulness in that strength. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Are yeah, you I'm in, are you in that? Are you holding Avni's hand or is that somebody else? No, that's somebody else. Okay. I'm, I'm also, I'm, <laughs> I'm also in the water, but I'm in the water with my camera. Yeah. Oh yeah. There. Cause the camera is so low to the water. I thought, could it be perched on a rock? But no, you wouldn't. You know, I said six people, but um, Avni is pregnant with Surya in that photograph. Uh -huh. so there's a, seven. there's a, even a, even a seventh um, person who hasn't been born yet, but now is, yeah. is, is running around the world. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, <laughs> because I, I can tell, I know that I can tell by looking at it, that she's pregnant, even though it's from behind, you know, and I don't know exactly when you took the picture, but without you having to say that, I knew that she was already pregnant. <laughs> Maybe it's the way she's sitting yeah, there's something <laughs> like, she's, with her yeah. legs apart. Yeah, like her body, that, is, her body has that woman way. more weight to it than it usually does. Yeah. 
so are you um are you sort of slowly building a body with a book in mind or a show or anything like that or is it it's still early on that front well i've enjoyed making the two books that i've made so much that i do you know once these pictures start to you know as they've started to feel like especially some of them are really they're working they're speaking to me i have a relationship to them it's hard you know, I, my mind goes to wanting to see them together in a book and, um, you know, you know, I'd also like them to be, and I think one of the things I think about a lot as a photographer is what's the way to share these images with people that feels true to them would impact Mm -hmm. them. Um, Instagram has a tremendous reach and it's such a, insufficient way to experience a photograph you know the picture is small it goes by quickly even for me as a photographer in an image that resonates with me on in that space it's hard to slow down and look at it um yeah yeah for sure i'd like these images to be big on a wall somewhere but not inside a gallery where only a few people go but instead somewhere where lots of people would get to see them that's not always easy to make that happen but but just thinking about whatever ways I can share them with people that would give them a chance to look at them um, when they're not you know, I, in that mode I've, of the social media scroll is, is yeah. you know, part of how I think about what should happen with the pictures. For, I mean, for me, a, you know, and this experience came back to me looking through invitations encounters just a couple nights ago. I mean, I think a book we've done well and both of your books have been done really well. I think Invitations Encounters especially was just really beautifully laid out and printed and everything about it is just right on in terms of the quality and the experience that you have um, looking through it. And of course that has to do with the pictures themselves being as engaging as they are. Uh, But I think, you know, and I, I certainly could say that some photographs I've had or some photographers, I've had a better experience immersing myself in a book of their work on my own in the privacy of wherever than I have in a gallery somewhere. I mean, I love looking at pictures in a gallery too, but depending on the context, if it's an opening and there's people talking and carrying around paper cups with drinks in it and, and, and like the, the photographer is there, all that stuff is cool. And I'm sure we sort of miss it at this point after too long of not having enough of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think a book is a very, if done well, is a very fitting form for a collection of photographs yeah absolutely I mean you know I think even before I started taking my photography um thinking about it in as as an art form that I was practicing in an ongoing way as a creative person I was collecting snapshots that that I had maybe I don't even want to call them snapshots they were the beginnings of my interest in photography as as an aesthetic process and a record keeping process but putting them together in an album um was it was a necessary part of that Mm -hmm. experience of being in a situation wanting to photograph it getting the four by six prints back um and then which ones did i want to put into the album and in what order um yeah i i think that's still um i agree that it's it's such a great way to get to experience pictures uh uh, that could be a segue to talk about the relationships that exist between images that aren't obviously connected and then you put them next to each other and then there's this space in between um this meaning that's created uh by just by proximity and i on your website now i'm seeing and, and in some of the images you sent me there's also more images without human subjects in them. And that's, um, that's, I obviously I'm seeing the connections more strongly now after hearing you talk about this, the composed photos being specifically about our relationship to the natural world and what's happening to the planet. And so when I'm, I'm looking at a picture, for example, right now of a 
the stump of an enormous tree that has been chopped from the top is fallen over on its side so that its roots are exposed. It's completely dried out. It's been dead for a long time behind a barbed wire fence. Um, and it has this very dry kind of feeling to it. And then put that next to a stunning aerial shot of a canyon. What canyon is that? Is that the Grand Canyon or Bryce or? That's, um, that's in Taos, New Mexico. Okay. Um, it, it's that that piece of the canyon is spanned by a by a bridge and okay and that was made um, not a drone shot. not a drone no i'm 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 holding <laughs> the, the hasselblad on a drone <laughs> and walking walking across that and um i think that was the one frame that i that i shot from at least of at least of that angle um there looking down into the canyon yeah, I mean, seeing seeing the water there, it's it's so far below that it feels really peaceful. Um, mm -hmm. The the cut into the earth is, um, you know, it's an intense space that water has cut, you know, through that landscape. Yeah, that over, story of time over is thousands of years. There are other ways that we're cutting into, you know, that there are probably places in the world where mines are cut that deep, you know, over a relatively mm -hmm. short span of time mm -hmm. and, and doing damage and leaving, you know, leaving pollution and, and, and uh, spaces that were once inhabitable, uninhabitable. Um, but noticing that, that, you know, given time that, that water will, will alter a landscape slowly and just the, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of, we see the layers, we see the layers in the, in the land. Um, yeah, because because the water is cut down, down through and, and slowly eroded. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk some about that, that phenomenon of putting what happens when you put this picture next to that picture and, and sequencing and, and what you're doing now on your website, which is, um, it's a grid. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, let's. I, I think that the something that I've thought about in in I thought about in both of my my books, which are more um, our documentary photography and street photography. Um, it was important to me to have pauses between the photographs of people, um, where we just look at the the natural or built environment and, and details there, mm -hmm. um, because because you will will never look at those things as much when there's a human being like you know we're we're, we're, we're yes. a social species and a picture with a person becomes about that person um mm -hmm. and and i think we all also know that something different happens to us when we get to experience solitude whether it's solitude on a quiet street or solitude in the middle of a forest or or next to a river um or next to the ocean. So trying to give the mind that, that space to sort of exist in, in, in openings. I definitely, um, you know, a puddle, a, a, a gap in the trees, some kind of space that can be entered into often, um, I think, attracts me in, in the same way that a, that a face can. There's like a, an invitation mm. to go in and, and, and connect. Um, so, and, and likewise, I, there's a picture of a, of a fire there amidst, you know, amongst those pictures and the experience of getting lost, looking at a, getting lost, being in one spot, uh, staring at a fire and the, mm -hmm both just the destructive and uh, creative power of a fire uh, I think also kind of can slow you down to to sort of think about where you connect that's or that's that's the hope mm -hmm. um, you know the that, that picture you were talking about of that of that overturned stump um, the fact that there's that barbed wire fence in front of it, that there is some sort of barrier there that we would have to pass through to, to connect and that human beings do create all these barriers um, 
but but it fades and and the stump certainly there's a violence to it having been upended um Mm -hmm. and but seeing all those strands of the roots that have been dried out and 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 cut off i think is a reminder of the just how freaking connected everything is <laughs> and mm-hmm. and how much a, you know a tree connects with the earth and it um i've been learning more about how people who study forests have come to understand how interconnected all the f- trees in a forest are and in ways that that plants communicate with each other that humans didn't understand until recently i guess putting us putting us face to face with um the potential for destruction and the fact that people have have created destruction of the natural world, but in a way that reminds us of, of the power and that that tree spent time reaching out and that every tree that's still alive you mm-hmm. know, is reaching down into the earth and reaching up into the sky. And, um, and I think people's people reaching, reaching for each other, reaching for the land, uh, reaching for the water mm. uh, can be very is, is very literally important and and sometimes becomes a metaphor also in my in my pictures yeah it's really powerful to hear you talk about it and as i'm looking at the grid on the website and realizing that there it's just these these all, all of these are reach these are reaching out to connect with the with the person who's looking at them it's it's we can see you the person making the photograph reaching out to connect with the subject whether it's a person or a, a moment in an environment in which um, it's it's just beholding something that's happening naturally or something that has happened, um, and those are two two really different modes of connecting with the things that are most important for us to connect with other humans. So a lot of your pictures are about that connecting with other humans, and then these pictures that you're describing that don't have people in them are about connecting with all of the non-human aspects of the planet that we inhabit and there's an aloneness to them there's like a solitude and you and you mentioned how like when you're on your own in an environment how much more likely you are to be able to have a meaningful moment of observation or a feeling of connectivity with something like a gap or an overturned stump or just a collection of wildflowers in a vacant lot in Brooklyn or a fire. Um, And there are the moments that are more obvious, like being on a bridge suspended over a stunning Canyon versus, or, you know, or something much less obvious. And then, you know, living in New York city, um, you know, the, the, you, you don't have the Canyon moments, but you have other, you have, you're sort of forced in a way to look for smaller moments of natural occurrence. Um, and I don't know, it's just, it's, it's really fascinating to think about how equally important it is to be, to have experiences in the world where you are alone as well as experiences in the world where you are connecting with other people in their physical presence. But, but then there's also like, I personally, more often than not, my experience of connecting with nature, it, it, it is more profound when I am experiencing it on my own, or at least in a very quiet context, maybe with one other person, maybe with Vicky, my wife, or with Nico, my son. Um, but even more so, you know, if I'm going to get down and look closely at, you know, at a tiny flower, chances are that's only going to happen when I'm alone or maybe with my son, you know, or with Vicky. And so, sorry, I'm going on and on, but I'm getting somewhere uh, as I go. I hope um, that, that that connectivity is reliant upon both being social and being around other people, but also on solitude in order to really recognize that everything is connected. You need a kind of quietude and you need a space in which you're not thinking about what anybody else is thinking about what you're doing or how much, how much attention you're giving to this tiny, seemingly 
tiny thing while there are other things that could be discussed, you know, or other jokes that could be made or, you know, any thoughts <laughs> thoughts well, on that yeah the way that that it, sort of goes in multiple directions that are really quite different but all related oh and i wanted to bring it back to the to the composed photographs which are blending both of those things now together which is to say okay we're going to be together i'm not alone in nature i am in nature with people that i'm close to we should say that about the new photos is that from what i've seen all of them are with people that you are very close to, um, or at least know. Um, and, um, you know, some of them with your immediate nuclear family, your mom and your dad and your sister and partner and best friends and their kids. Um, but so here you are saying, okay, let's, I wonder if we can combine those two things and go out into nature together as a group and still have a sort of a group experience of beholding the importance and the all connectedness of it. Yeah, I think, well, I have, a, I have a few different thoughts about that. You know, one is that, um, is that the experience of the photograph um, for me or for a viewer, um, it doesn't, require an interaction. And so you get to have that quiet moment with the photograph where you're not needing to say thank you to it or tell it the next story or ask it a question about its life. You just get to sit with it. So even if there's human beings there, um, certainly I want them to convey a level of peace or centeredness or connection or or reaching that's not urgent, um, but that you also get to experience it kind of and take your time with it. In your in own way time. That, and in your own time and in the way that yeah. being being alone in nature gives you that that alone time. Yeah, which speaks back to the, the book versus being able to look at a book on your own versus being in a gallery and sort of being expected to say something or to look at something a certain way for a certain amount of time. You know, it's... Yeah. I think it's spot on what you're saying that like one of the magical things about seeing a really interesting photo, especially of a person is that like, if you were in real life, you wouldn't, it would not be socially acceptable to stop and stare at this person, you know, but the photograph gives you that privilege of connecting and, you know, hopefully not ogling not, your pictures, obviously absolutely zero of them are seem to be about any kind of sensationalism or giving, giving the viewer an opportunity to sort of ogle over something that they would, that they, you know, that would be embarrassing in a unsavory kind of way to look right. at for too long. You know what I mean? It's much more about like, I'm giving us all the gift of being able to really take this in, in a way that you wouldn't as you're walking through the market or saying hello to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, it's good. And I think, you know, where I think I personally long for moments with other people that feel like enough of the trivialities of life have fallen away or aren't present or what we're doing there together is so important that we can just really experience it whether it's just connecting with each other or whether there's some greater task that, that is uh, where we have a purpose together um, and suggesting that with, with the way I've set up some of the photos, uh, I think mm -hmm. is like, a, it's, it's a fantasy of mine or it's a, it's, it's, it's something that I aspire to like, um, you know, a group of people uh, asleep and kind of a, on each other cuddled in this, in the sand, um, mm -hmm not looking necessarily perfectly comfortable, but also totally at ease with where they found themselves and with plenty of sand to be around them mm -hmm. choosing to all be right there intertwined. Um, have I ever experienced that quite with a whole several other people where I'm not too worried about whether 
you know, everybody's comfortable and are we all, you know, is somebody mm -hmm. else feeling embarrassed or, or uh, like I'm invading their personal space, but just totally sinking into the sand. And maybe it's because we're exhausted and maybe it's because we've just been through something so intense together that it's changed our relationship or maybe it's mm -hmm. um, that we're the last hope for each other, but that those other worries could fall away and we could just experience that, um, you know. There's yeah. a picture of your wife and your mother-in-law there that um, I took to be a good friend because you two had just you had just been married and uh, wanted to document that time, but um, the, because of so much had gone into making that time on that mountain special, the way that the two of them are looking at each other seems so full of presence and um, unposed that there's a there's something that just speaks to love and connection between between generations and, and in a space that i i'm i'm borrowing that photo and pulling it in mm -hmm. uh because don't we all want that moment with the people that we love that's that pure i think i think that that suggesting that that's possible um with others is is part of what i I long for, and I think that when we reach for that, it, it gives us more chance of a positive future as a, you know, as a species, mm -hmm. if we can go towards those kinds of things. Yeah, it's, I like that, the, um, the idea of it, of it being a, f a, f a fantasy that you're willing into existence, you know, and, um, and, even if it's staged that way, um, it still is, it's making that fantasy come into reality in some form, you know, it's, it didn't happen naturally, but now there are, you know, uh, there are a collection of people that are down on the sand together, all sort of twisted together in this beautiful pinwheel kind of formation. And that really happened. <laughs> you know, yes, it's not a, yes. <laughs> not a drawing of it. It really happened. You made it happen. And while it may be sort of like the, the experience of it as, a, uh, as it was happening in reality, probably, you know, there's somebody might have made a joke here that not that not that that devalues it at all. But like someone may have been like, oh, this is this, there's a stone digging into my hip. How much longer do we have to hold this? You know, like that could have been happening, but that's not in the picture. And the picture gets to be still a fantasy. Um, and and it's cool to know that 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 form actually happened there there was a moment where those people got down on the on the beach and did that together yes um and it, it, it and it's something that that you know never happened before and wouldn't happen again naturally um and that's just powerful and interesting to look at i think in that way i i i think that these pictures and the process of making them there's a there's a connection to performance art and some kinds mm -hmm. of performance art yeah. where I do want them to be absolutely aesthetic. And I'm thinking about colors that people are wearing in light and what's around, but, but staging something that does occur and then documenting it where, where people did that and they experienced it. And the photograph is a, is a record of it is, is part of how I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, there's a picture of my sister uh, crouching down and, and setting a little raft afloat in, in the water. And, mm -hmm. and that was an afternoon that my sister and I were hanging out in the woods and we made that raft just so we could put it in a photograph, but it was so fun to be basically children, you know, be doing yeah. what children would do, making something. And even if the photograph had been lost, uh, we got to have that experience together. Um, and that's meaningful to me. Uh, so, so to have that, to create it for the project, to experience it, to put it in a yeah. photograph that hopefully carries that metaphor forward or gives other people mm -hmm. a chance to connect with it is all um, part of what I'm interested in here. Yeah, the experience itself is, is the connective tissue as well. There's two 
raft things with your sister, Amy. The one with the fire on it as well. Do you want to, I'm very curious about that. If you want to talk about it for a moment, uh, just to sure. describe it, um, you, <clears throat> you sent me two images. Um, one clearly happens earlier in the fire, but it's a, looks like a chunk of wood that's floating in a pond or s pretty still river or something like that with a raging teepee fire built on top of it, like a Viking funeral or something. <laughs> And um, and is that Amy swimming right behind it there as well? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, so tell me about that day. Yeah, um, the the fire fire in the water was it was an image that was in my head for a long time. I think I had seen a picture of some fire floating in the water a long time before, and it had stuck in my head and made me think about about funeral pyres just about about that dichotomy of fire and water um the beauty of getting to experience uh, you know the blaze of the fire also in a reflection and, and twice and uh it was something that i just wanted to try the idea of going to it you know swimming swimming after it um obviously it's uh, fire is is, is necessarily uh, something you have to keep your distance from to some extent or, or it's dangerous. And so playing with like, is there a reason to go to this fire? Does it draw you in? Um, my sister, somebody that I love to swim with and she, she's a real, you know, she's a dedicated swimmer in all, in all, in all weather and in all kinds of contexts. So she was a, an obvious choice to, to do that picture with. And, um, and, uh, and it was it was like it was a it was a technical challenge to solve like what could we mm. put the fire on that would float and finding like a half like a big big log cut that had been cut in half that had a flat uh, flat side that we could build it on and figuring out whether it would stay stay up and then we got the f fire going even more you know it was blazing hotter than I even expected and. And as she was trying to kind of shove it out into the water so that we could get the picture, it was, uh, she said she had to like actually duck under the water to get close enough to touch it. Cause it was so hot. Uh, and uh, I, that's one that, that even more so than some of the others was just this idea in my head and not sure exactly what it meant, but, um, mm -hmm. just one, like, you know, the fire is out there and, and, and you're going to it. And then when we were actually doing it, you know, it didn't look exactly how I had it in my mind because, because we had to work with the elements and, and where the yeah, fire, where it, it would, yeah. where it would float and where would she go? But then trying to respond in the moment to like, what's actually what's happening and what's the, what's, what are the best aesthetic possibilities? Um, and I don't know, I, you know, ultimately whether the picture of her swimming towards the, the real blazing one versus mm -hmm just off from the from the embers later whether they both um you know do i want to show both of them i don't know right yeah. you know, does one does one tell the story better than the other do they need to be together uh i think i think i need more time with them before i know that but but yeah i would lean towards saying yeah, go ahead. If, you, if there were only gonna be one i think i would maybe it's a surprise, I would lean towards the one where it's embers. So the second image, which hasn't been described yet, is um, is now the fire has burned down. It seems like you were totally successful in uh, your technical solution to the project because it looks like the fire burned pretty beautifully down to a set of embers that are still glowing and a little bit of flame uh, as they're still floating on this chunk of wood. And then there's Amy, you know, just from the mouth up above water behind kind of blurry and the embers are what's in focus. And I think that way that there's, there's such a cool mystery to, I would imagine encountering that without seeing the image of the blazing fire beforehand, just be like, what is going on? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, that's my thought. Great. It's, it's some of the, some of these, maybe more so than the street photographs. You know, the street photographs. I necessarily was almost always a you know a stranger to the experience, and until right when it happened to me. Um, 
meeting somebody where they are, what they're wearing, how they're carrying themselves on the street. And it happens. Yeah. And I was there, but, but I was experiencing it anew. And so I can, I think I have a little bit more distance. Some of these, because I've spent time with the, uh, some sort of idea in my head, refined it and try to create it. And there's always some change that didn't, didn't look quite how I thought. It's harder to know often what does just seeing this picture do? What does it communicate? So mm -hmm. I, need, I need those outside eyes that, that what ended up here in the frame, does it, what's it saying to you? So that's good to hear about, about that. Yeah, I mean, this one is particularly full of mystery. Um, if you just look at that image, the, the second one. Um, but it's, 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 it makes sense in, in relationship to all all that we've been talking about since specifically, particularly since talking about the new wave of photographs that you're making, um, that it's, it's sort of a convergence of all of those things. The idea of having an experience that is very, you know, burning very hot of presence within a natural context with other people that you're close with that, you know, it's, if you, if you spent even just, you know, if, uh, a couple of paragraphs trying to write about the potential symbolisms and meanings. I think there would be so many things that could come up, you know, a person swimming behind a, a floating raft of burning embers in a pond. You know? yeah. Are there any other, um, are there any other avenues that you envisioned going down together that we haven't? I don't think so. I guess what mm -hmm. I'll say is, um, well, I guess the one thing that I, that I haven't said is that the choice to put my loved ones in these pictures is both, it's by necessity, but it's also something that I wanted to challenge myself to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think so. My, my earlier strongest impulses were curiosity about others that I didn't know and I could see the aesthetic possibilities in in photographing um, you know outside of my own experience more readily and mm -hmm. um, I'm okay with that I'm and I may go back there but you know deciding to also photograph my mother who is who 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 is an elder and isn't particularly somebody who's like focused on fashion or how she presents herself but deciding that she's somebody who's interesting to take a picture of and that I want to look at and put in a situation mm -hmm. with layers of meaning is something that I wanted to challenge myself to do and and see if I could um both experience that with her and translate her her body her presence mm -hmm. into something that would be interesting to look at for others um so i this project may branch out further into into people that are are not in my immediate circle and there's a couple mm -hmm. people here here who aren't um but it's been important to me to to have had th those who, who i'm near and dear to be be a piece of this um so that I could um, kind of not not shy away from what I really mean in these pictures about about, about a coming together um, mm -hmm. with uh, an experience, something meaningful. At times, it's almost felt like forcing myself, not in a bad way, but just mm -hmm. in a in a way like um, choosing to see those people who I'm around a new and, mm -hmm. and putting them in a new context and, and being fascinated by what they could look like in these situations um, is, a, is a good challenge. To yeah. It's a beautiful thing to do. It's, and it, it honors them and honors your relationship to them. And I totally know what you mean. If I were in your position, I'm sure that making um, vulnerable, intimate images with my own, mom my own sister would um definitely be a challenge for me you know get sort of getting past the um the usual 
lanes that we tend to see. Exactly, the usual Um, Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I imagine that, well, I, I won't project, but I imagine that they felt honored to be in that, um, f- in that mode of interaction with you. And then it was interesting and refreshing for everybody. Yes, I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and even as I was sometimes putting them in slightly physically uncomfortable, if not also emotionally uncomfortable situations to make the photographs, they mm-hmm. were, um, they were very thankful. And that was great to, that was great to experience um, as, as an artist and, and as a member of my family. And so it's, Mm -hmm. it is, it is akin actually in some ways to the experience of seeing a stranger and wondering how would this person feel about being approached and then having Mm -hmm. them be flattered and interested in me just as I'm interested in them and open to the process of taking a picture um, and realizing that, it was worth getting over whatever would hold me back um, in order mm-hmm. to engage them in a in part of my artistic process. Mm. Well, that's a great way to think about it too, because it, you know, it's it's pretty difficult to see your own immediate family as like just an independent human being. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, there's just you know, it's mom is mom, dad is dad, sister brother. It, uncle grandparent they're just it's so it would it takes so much active work to be able to alter that that relationship in any significant way you know um and it's a valiant thing to try to do at all because it's not something that most people ever really (laughs) do um so i applaud you it's an inspiration i think All right. Well, thanks, Sam. Thanks for initiating this. I'm, I'm... Thank you, Vern. It was a pleasure to be able to have the conversation and um, hope I didn't talk too much uh, as the interviewer. <laughs> it's, I, I, I love hearing your thoughts about the work and about the, about the process. And, um, you haven't been in any of these new uh, set of photographs yet, but um, maybe be, be, pre- be prepared to be asked yeah. when we have a when we have a little bit more ease in time wherever we're in the same place because um, yeah. it's definitely an ongoing process. I would love to be. Yeah. Good.